I am Daniel Langua. I am a veterinarian and board certified specialist in veterinary internal medicine at Michigan State University, and I study liver diseases in dogs and cats. Copper is an essential nutrient. You absolutely need it in your body. The vast majority of this copper is stored in your liver. However, in a condition that we're seeing in, in recent years and even the past two decades, copper-associated hepatitis, copper can accumulate to really abnormal amounts. And once it overwhelms the ability of the liver to store the, this copper, it can result in a lot of inflammation or what we would call hepatitis. And this can progress to fibrosis or if untreated, actual liver cirrhosis and even death in some cases. We once thought this to be an exceedingly rare condition, but starting in the early 2000s, we started to recognize this condition in a variety of purebred dogs, Dalmatians, Doberman Pinschers, and most recently in Labrador Retrievers, which are the most popular breed of dog in the United States. We know, at least from data that we've collected at our institution, roughly half of all Labrador Retrievers that are undergoing liver biopsy have really high copper concentrations in their liver. What's actually equally as concerning is that some of these breeds that aren't classically considered predisposed to copper storage disease, we're actually finding increased copper in a lot of those liver samples as well. The exact causes of the disease haven't been fully established, and there does at least seem in some breeds of dogs to be a genetic predisposition to it, so there are likely genetic factors involved. However, genetics certainly do not explain all of the disease. And the big focus in recent years and the focus of our group has been what is the role of dietary copper in this disease. If you look back to the amount of copper that is required to be supplemented in dog food, this has actually changed over the years. And one of the biggest changes that occurred, at least in the dog food industry, was that in the mid-1990s, uh, the regulations concerning the type of copper that were placed in dog food changed. And it changed from copper oxide, which wasn't very well absorbed, to a much more bioavailable or a form of copper that can be absorbed uh, in, in these diets. And this increase in copper exposure is likely uh, related to the reason that we're seeing so much copper-associated hepatitis in the past 15 to 20 years. To put things in perspective, the change in copper formulations likely resulted in some dogs experiencing anywhere from 10 to 20 times increases in copper exposures. When many of these companies are formulating their diets to meet these minimum requirements, they're often adding a mineral premix to do so. In many cases, this is done without really considering the amount of copper in the native ingredients in the diet. One of the big differences that occurred is that the companies were traditionally using copper oxide, which was very cheap and easy to add to dog food, but not so well absorbed. However, this really wasn't a problem as copper deficiency was really never documented in dogs at any time during the, the period of feeding these uh, diets that were supplemented with copper oxide. The newer forms of copper, the copper sulfates, the copper chelates, they are absorbed much more easily from the GI tract, and this results in dogs often experiencing 10 to 20 times increases in copper exposures from what they were historically exposed to with the old diets work that we've done here at our institution, as well as some reports that have emerged from Cornell, have suggested that a large proportion of this uptick in, in copper-associated hepatitis really occurred simultaneously with these changes in the requirements concerning copper supplementation in dog food. And we can look at our own database, and roughly a quarter of Labradors undergoing liver biopsy prior to this time period had abnormal copper concentrations. We're now somewhere in the realm of 50 to 70% of Labradors undergoing liver biopsies have high copper concentrations. So we recently completed an investigation in partnership with our diagnostic laboratory in which we investigated uh, copper concentrations in biopsy specimens over a 35 year period of time. We looked at over 500 samples during this time period. And so one of our really big focuses was looking at copper concentrations in a period from 1982 through around the mid 1990s and then looking at copper concentrations after that time period in dogs, given that that really coincided with the changing regulations concerning copper supplementation in dog food. I think one of the more interesting results that we found is that we did identify a markedly increased prevalence of pathologic copper accumulation in dogs. And what was also interesting is that this didn't only affect the Labradors, the Dobermans, the West Highland White Terriers, the Dalmatians, these classic breeds that we think of as having copper-associated hepatitis, but we also found that copper concentration had increased in breeds that aren't classically considered predisposed to this disease. And from a clinical standpoint, this can be a really challenging disease to diagnose. Liver disease in general can result in very nonspecific changes on blood work, and there are no clinically minimally invasive ways to diagnose this disease. It actually requires that we as clinicians go in and get a liver biopsy or a sample of liver tissue. This typically requires general anesthesia, often a surgical procedure, and in many cases it's associated with a client cost of anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000.
counselors. Even following treatment and for lifelong monitoring, you have to repeat liver biopsy to truly know what that copper concentration is in the liver and to really monitor how successful you are in your therapies. So not only do many of these dogs need an initial liver biopsy for diagnosis, they often require an additional biopsy at some point to establish how they're responding to therapy. The treatment of this disease is also not straightforward. For dogs that are, that are sick or have more advanced disease, we typically have to use drugs that are called copper chelators. These drugs will bind with copper stores in the body and result in them sort of turning into a more water-soluble form that can be eliminated by the kidneys. The problem with these drugs is that they do have side effects. Uh, many dogs will vomit on them. The other big limitation we face is that they're very expensive. Another route that we can go from a treatment standpoint, especially dogs for early disease, as well as dogs that we're trying to keep into remission, is that we can restrict dietary copper concentrations. And that seems to be effective in a large number of dogs. That also really ties back to what we think is likely a big cause in this disease, and that dietary copper concentrations certainly do influence hepatic copper concentrations in these dogs. The dogs that we catch very early in the process, we often can chelate them, we can often restrict their dietary copper, and these dogs do very well. The problem that we encounter way too often though is that many times we don't even make a diagnosis until dogs are presenting with clinical illness. They're sick, they're vomiting, and at this point they often have really advanced liver disease, and in some of these cases the damage is already done and we're unable to reverse some of the permanent scarring that has occurred in the liver. In general, we think this is a disease that is underdiagnosed. It's not on the radar for many clinicians, but it is something that we do see quite frequently here. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a disease that we're seeing with increasing prevalence.